If you ask me the question, do I believe that China will continue to rise as a superpower and have ever greater influence in the world? And yes, 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 yes. Do I think that translates into good investment results? Not necessarily. Let's say a Russian roulette, let's say there was 20 barrels, 30 barrels, 40 barrels. Let's say the odds were really in my favor. Would mm. I kind of, would I pull the trigger yeah. on a hundred million dollar bet? My life is worth a little bit more than that. Hey everyone, Ben here and welcome to Motivation to Invest. Today we've got a very special guest. We've got Mo Linsky, who is the CEO of Prime Quadrant, which is Canada's leading investment research and consulting firm. Prior to Prime Quadrant, Mo was the co-founder and owner of several companies. In addition, Mo has a great heart and sits on a number of charitable boards. He's also the author of various books on investing, such as In Search of the Prime Quadrant, The Quest for Better Investment Decisions. So Mo is an extremely intelligent guy. He's got multiple degrees in economic psychology and an MBA from the University of Toronto. So in this video, Mo's really going to share with us some of his investing tips, investing experience, and maybe to help us to make better investment decisions. Your thoughts on investing into China, because obviously there's a lot of talk about obviously the Chinese tech crackdown. A lot of people are staying away from China. I've been following quite a few of the hedge funds and many were buying Chinese stocks. Now they're selling Chinese stocks. And what are your thoughts on that? Do you think China's a good investment? Uh, we do have some exposure and I do have some exposure to China through some of the managers that I'm allocated to, but it is not an area that I would focus on personally. It is not an area uh, that I would have conviction in simply because you always feel like you're sort of standing on quicksand. And, and, and it's not, again, do I, if you ask me the question, do I believe that China will continue to rise as a superpower and have ever greater influence in the world and be have, have a, a, fund, a greater economic presence over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Yes, 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 yes. Do I think that translates into good investment results? Not necessarily. And I don't know one way or the other. I'm just saying that it's hard to handicap the downside in a world where the Chinese government could come along and say, oh, you were a public for-profit enterprise yesterday. You are a nonprofit organization tomorrow. Like, mm. and just with, you know, or where they could take as, as you saw in the Evergrande finance, I mean, fiasco, I think what, what you were referring to is the, some of the ed tech um, collapses. Uh, but I think, you know, in the Evergrande uh, bankruptcy, like the fact that somebody else could be prioritized simply on the basis of, um, it doesn't really matter what the cap capital stack mm. looks like. It's like, oh, you're a foreigner, you're secondary. <laughs> it's like yeah. that. That's that's a hard partner to uh, engage with. I mean, it's just it's kind of in the life is too hard bucket. So it's just not something that I personally pursue in any active way, nor will in the very near future. Yeah, you're, you're obviously you're bullish on the economic prospects of China, but again, in terms of an, an investment, if you were going to invest in China, let's say hypothetically having 20% of someone's portfolio in general would be too much in China? I personally wouldn't do it, but- You wouldn't I, do I, it? Yeah, okay. I wouldn't do it. No, I wouldn't put 10% of my portfolio in China. I mean, I probably have something- Okay. Uh, no, that's very interesting. through managers, but that has nothing to do with the, the Chinese uh, economic story. It has everything yeah. to do with when it, when it hits the fan, like- mm whose interests are going to be prioritized and is it going to be prioritized in accordance to what we would in North America regard as rule of law or in, in other parts of the Western world? Um, or is it going to be prioritized by a completely exogenous agenda that has nothing to do with the rights of investors? And it's just a risk they can't handicap. I mean, in some ways, it's almost like playing Russian roulette. Like, let's say a Russian roulette, let's say there was 20 barrels, 30 barrels, 40 barrels. Let's say the odds were really in my favor. Would mm. I kind of, would I pull the trigger yeah. on a hundred million dollar bet, my life is worth a little bit more than that. And so I, I just, uh, I also, the sleep at night factor of that comes into the equation. So anyway, I, I, it's not the risk of, of having your assets appropriated is not mm. something that I'm interested in personally taking. Yeah, no, it makes sense. There's obviously, there is a theory that if you have investments into China, they could potentially go to zero just from the whole allocations with with China and the, the risk of delisting and value investor, obviously Charlie Munger, he's invested heavily. He's got 20% of his portfolio in Alibaba stock. 
And that's why a lot of people followed him into that stock and a lot of value investors followed him into that stock. Um, Tencent as well. I think it's because you've got the risk of the Chinese, but then where there's risk, there can be potentially value. And what, what do you think about that? There can be. I'm just not a strong enough adjudicator of how to create a positive asymmetry on that risk in my favor. So okay. as a yeah. result, it's just not something I, I would want to participate in. I mean, China can't continue to grow by screwing the world. Like that that won't yeah. happen, right? So it, it, their growth prospects will, will stunt. But well, what can happen is a variety of restrictions and um, sort of black swan type of events that I just simply cannot handicap I think that there are other parts of the world and other sectors and industries where you could get comparable rates of return with a more manageable risk. And by the way, just Ben, one one last thing that I will say is, you know, invariably all of us are are invested in China in some way, shape or form. If you have a company that's a German company or a North American company and their largest customers are Chinese, you have exposure to China, right? So yeah. um, there's uh, countless ways in which all of us have China exposure mm. in our portfolios, even if we do not have direct dollars in the ground in China. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at it to, to get that exposure to China, but in a more risk, risk-free risk way, shall I say. What, what areas are you bullish on then? What maybe industries, maybe funds, stocks, if you want to talk about that? Stocks, I don't do too much stock picking, but I, I think that areas that, are of interest are areas where capital is inefficiently allocated. Areas, for example, of late that we've, uh, we've, allocated, we've allocated some money to, the aviation industry, which has historically, it's, it's an old business, got a lot of traditional financing from the banks. Yeah. And when COVID hit, the banks basically got nervous about, and the other financial institutions got nervous about their aviation credit exposure, right? Their, their various loans to the banks. And they're selling off those loans and they have been selling off those loans you know, at, at discounts aggressively. Mm-hmm. Now, when you look at some of those loans, those are asset-backed loans against the uh, planes and they're money good. I mean, even if you take the breakup value of the planes in the most conservative way and all of the infrastructure around them, you know, oftentimes, um, you would still come out with a healthy return, even if the, that, the company defaulted on the debt. Uh, and on top of that, they provide a fairly healthy coupon. So you're able to get, you know, sort of double digit yields or high single digit yields and double digit IRRs, you know, lending to, and similar to shipping, um, shipping industry, you're able to lend to companies that are almost investment grade, or in some cases, investment grade. But, you know, there's, uh, the banks have have sort of withdrew or limited their uh, credit capacity to these uh, to these companies. So that's an area of interest, you know, sort of going into the asset back space, uh, asset back lending space. Areas like private debt, venture debt. There's specialty finance plays where Square and Stripe like are basically lending to their consumers, and because they see the payment flow, they're able to handicap that risk quite well, and they're able to take provide short-term loans, very small loans, and thousands of them. Mm. Uh, and the risk of default, very, very low. And yet they're able to charge outsized returns. So those, that's a you know strategy that um, we're about to uh, actually put some money into. And then um, uh, something that we've been doing for years, which I still have a high degree of conviction in, is um, actually a higher degree of conviction in, um, is in the private equity market, um, Participating in GP stakes, buying minority interests in the asset in the private equity firms, uh, as opposed to merely as a, a limited partner uh, in those private equity firms, and that's been great because that's one of the few private equity strategies that provide current cash flow because you're getting paid the management fees and other economics uh, even in advance of like the traditional J curve of you know of a typical private equity limited partnership deal. And um, you mentioned aviation. Is that a bet on, obviously you've got the, you said the breakdown value of the of the planes. It's obviously backed by that. But is that really a bet on travel to rebound? Because isn't aviation historically, while well, more airlines got historically really poor returns on capital? That's just what I, I believe I've read that previously. You know, it's, it's, um, I, it's not, it's not really a bet. Um, 
it's not really a bet on on the aviation industry. It's uh, again with some of these asset back loans. I mean, I guess it is on a, on some level because you know if planes if there was no need for an aviation industry, then the planes would have no value. But mm. it's not really a bet that that we're going to see year over year growth of X. You know. Uh, from Air Canada or British Airways or whatever, like that's that's not the play. It, it really is a function of there is a, a dislocation or sort of a, an inefficiency in how credit is allocated to uh, to aviation companies, and if and uh, and on top of that, there are existing loans that are being sold off simply because some banks. Um, risk committee said, oh, we got to get mm. these off the books. And yeah. so it doesn't really matter whether that's credible or not credible. You're able to buy discounted paper and you're able to get healthy yields on that. And sometimes the the terms on those is a fairly short, it could be, you know, two, three years and you get all your money back and, and, uh, and get paid back at par, even though you paid less than par for those loans. So really, really that's a be, be greedy when others are fearful. That's what that is. But yeah, that's, yeah. That's exactly what it is. That's in, exactly a, in a general it. way. And one piece of advice you would give to the people watching, maybe on life and then also on investing. Yeah. <laughs> Difficult question for a, for a yeah. morning. In a... <laughs> exactly. On life, I mean, look, I think that generally speaking, what has served me well and what I try to tell my kids is, is do the right thing the right way for the right reasons and always leave a little bit on the table for those around you, uh, a little extra than... Um, do a little bit more than you have to. Um, I had a mentor once who was an incredibly successful um, businessman and sat down with him and I said, you know, how is it that you've done as well as you have? And he said to me, he said, you know, after every deal that I've closed, we've negotiated the deal, we signed it, it's over, it's done. I gave them back something that I negotiated originally for myself. I gave it, the deal was done. We already sealed, we agreed, everybody, everybody was happy. But then I gave them something extra. And he said that little extra earned me decades of goodwill in life, always giving a little bit more than you're taking, um, always going a little bit above and beyond what you need to do uh, is generally appreciated and serves people well over time. Now, ve very, very insightful stuff. Um, but yeah, it's been great having you on, Mo. Thanks for being here. Um, you guys invest safe in the markets and I'll see you in the next video. Invest safe.